tonight of when a woman will rule. We're going to continue our study in the prophecy, and tonight you will really have to have your thinking hats on. Tonight is one of the most difficult to stay with. And uh, sometimes you wonder, you know, about people who come in in the middle. You kind of think, well, these guys is nuts. You know, if you don't, if you didn't have the foundation night after night, you know, well, I'm going to show you some things on here that you'll say, I don't know where he comes up with that if you haven't been caught up night to night. But I'll say this right in the beginning as we have a new face or two or three around. Several new faces tonight. God has honest-hearted people in the Roman Catholic Church. Amen. Thank you. God has honest-hearted people in the Catholic Church that love Him and will be in heaven. But tonight, I'm going to talk about the organization. I'm not talking about any one person, as I said, because God has saved people in every church. you believe that? Okay. So tonight, I want to say that as I talk about the papacy, I'm talking about the organization, and I'm talking about the organization that God has talked about since way, way back there for thousands of years, and He has put that organization in His prophecies, along with the others. Okay, to understand this prophecy, we'll be putting together a summary on the topics that we've studied so far. We've studied Daniel 2, you remember that, we studied Daniel 7. Then we went to Revelation 13, and tonight we're in Revelation 17. As they come together, you're going to find yourself right down to our present time, all right? We are even going to be looking at what will take place in the future. God wants us to know, so he's put it in this book, and this book is absolutely right on target. Don't listen to what I say, see what the Word says. I explained to someone tonight, as I was talking to him earlier, I said, you don't listen to what I say because I can look at any one topic and there'll be a thousand other uh, evangelists or speakers will be looking at it and saying something completely different. I want to show you what the Word of God says. My opinion's not worth much, but the Word of God is inerrant. No errors in the Word of God. You can depend on this book. It will not fail. Let me say again, do not trust your salvation to any denomination, not even the one I belong to. I don't trust my salvation to my church that I belong to. You can't do that. You can't do that. You cannot trust your salvation to any denomination. Let me go a step further. You cannot trust your salvation to tradition. I've talked to a number of people, and maybe you have too, who says, you know, and we're talking about the Bible, and I say something about to the effect of, well, you know, the Bible says this, and, and I'm wondering, you know, do you agree with that? Well, not really. My church doesn't do it that way. I guess we just follow tradition. And I'm thinking, you know, we can't base what we do on tradition. Amen? Amen. It's got to come from a thus saith the Lord. The Bible is our only safeguard. Yeah. Now, in the last century, there have been basically three women who have been in a position of rulership. And those women have done a wonderful job, just an exceptional job. Those three women are Golden May Heir of Israel, done a tremendous job, just done a great job. The second woman tonight is Queen Elizabeth from Great Britain. She's done a tremendous job. And then there was Margaret Thatcher, who was a well-known prime minister, one of the favorites of Britain. Those three women will go down into history as great, great leaders. But when you look at prophecy... God uses a woman to represent a church. Notice what the scripture says. Jeremiah 6 verse 2 says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate what? Come on. Woman. Woman. Woman, thank you. Zion is talking about the church. Another comparison is Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for who? Her. her. Who's the her? The church, right? All right. Verse 32 says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he's making the connection between himself and the church. The church then being represented as a what? As a woman. Yeah. It speaks in Matthew too about Christ being the bridegroom and the what being the, the bride? The church. Christ being the bridegroom and the church being his bride, all right? 
God simply uses a woman in Bible prophecy to represent a church. Okay? Now, when we look at Revelation chapter 12, we're going to touch on that just a little bit. You find this woman in 12 verse 1, Revelation chapter 12 verse 1. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. So this is a good woman, a pure woman, and we're going to talk more about her on another night. She is clothed with the sun and the moon is under her feet, a garland of 12 stars on her head. This represents God's church. Are you with me? Okay. Now, when we go to Revelation 17, there we find another woman who is riding on a scarlet-colored beast. It says this about her in Revelation 17, 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, and saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Think about that for a moment. She sits on many waters. What are the waters? We've studied this. People. Yeah, peoples. All right. She said to me, Come and I will show you the judgment. The angel said to me, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth. They were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So God is going to show us certain things about her. Now watch carefully. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a what colored beast? Scarlet, Scarlet beast, okay, which was full of names of blasphemy. This full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads. This is the scarlet beast now. He has seven heads, and he has ten horns, all right? The woman was arrayed in what was she arrayed? What color? Purple. Purple and scarlet. Who's the woman? A church, right? So the church, the woman, was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Okay, so this woman on the beast represents a false church. Are you with me? Okay. How was she dressed? Purple and scarlet. Okay, precious stones. Notice this. Revelation 17, 4, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Okay. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones. What colors are those? Purple and scarlet. All right, how about this one? Purple and scarlet again. One more. Purple and scarlet. Let me ask you this. Is this coincidence? No. This is not coincidence, is it? This is providence. This is prophecy fulfilled. Are you with me? God said that this woman on this beast, this church on this beast, would be dressed in purple and scarlet. And I just showed you the pictures. That's what you'll find during their official gatherings. That's the colors they wear. You think they know about the prophecy? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Now watch carefully because it says that she has something in her hand. Having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5, and on her forehead a name was written. What's your name? Mystery Babylon the Great. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So John sees this woman and she's riding on a what color beast? Scarlet colored beast. She's dressed in what colors? Purple. Yeah, scarlet and purple. You know, there it is again. And she was drunk with the blood of the saints. And she has her name written on her forehead. Now what we need to do tonight is we need to identify who this woman is and to identify the beast that she is riding on. Now, who this woman is and who the beast is. And of those four points, the first one has to be a world Power. She has to be a world power. As I said, you can't go off and look for some little group over in some remote country and say that's who this beast is or that's who this woman is. It has to be a world power. Are you with me? 
she has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. That's not some unknown little group over here, you see. She's been around for a long time, and she has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. The second point, she has to be a world power, a world, and she it leads the world astray from God's word, okay? She is a world power, but she's leading the world astray with contrary teachings from the word. And the wine cup, it talks about that she is holding. She's holding a wine cup. It represents Satan's deceptions regarding the scriptures. So this is the teachings that are contrary to the word of God. We, uh, it has to be a church that has taken a stand contrary to the scriptures. Point number three, she has to be a persecuting power. A persecuting power. She is represented because she is uh, represented as being drunk with the blood of the saints. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the martyrs of Jesus. So John says, when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. John says, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. And he said, wow, look at this. I just can't believe it. So we must look for a church, a worldwide church, that has led people contrary to the teachings of the scripture and that has persecuted the saints. And then the fourth point, the uniting of church and state. Folks, remember, this is where she got her power during those dark ages, that 1260 years of persecution. Where she got her power is because she had taken on civil power as well as power of the church. You remember that, right? Okay, verse 3 says... Uh, Uniting of church and state, which was, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Revelation 17, 3. So this woman is sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. A woman in Bible prophecy represents the church. It says that she's riding on a beast with seven heads and ten horns. So what do beasts represent? We covered that, Daniel 8, verse 20. It says, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. So a beast in Bible prophecy represents what? A nation or a civil power. So friends, if you have a woman riding on a beast, what do you have? Yeah, you have a union of church and state. You see, because the woman represents the church and the beast represents the state, so you have a union of them coming together, all right? You can trust these four points. You can mark them down. The church has to be a world power church that leads people contrary to the word. A church that has persecuted the saints of the Most High. And a church that has united with the state. Not hard to identify, is it? If you understand history, you can identify this power without any trouble tonight. All right, we're going to continue in Revelation 17, verse 3. Here's where it really begins to get complicated. I said you're going to need to keep on your thinking hats to stay with this. All right? It is so complicated, even the computer don't want to cooperate. All right, here we go. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman. Now, I want to stop right there for a second. I want to take a little more time. Who's writing the book of Revelation? John. Okay. Where is John at this time? He's on the island of Patmos, right? He's been exiled to the island because they tried to kill him. They couldn't, so they exiled him on this deserted island of Patmos. So John is writing the book, and he's on the Isle of Patmos. But here John says he has been carried where? He has been carried where? Into the wilderness in the spirit, in vision. Are you with me? John has been carried into the wilderness in vision, right? So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw this woman. We have to keep that in mind. As we look at this prophecy, you cannot look at it as if John is on the Isle of Patmos. Are you with me? You cannot remember that John's on the Isle of Patmos. Where is John? He's in the wilderness in vision. That's where he is, all right? He's in vision, in the wilderness. This is where people get off track. We forget that that's where John is while he's seeing this vision, okay? All right, as we look at it through John's eyes, we have to see it through his eyes and not mine or not yours. Are you with me, by the way? You understand what I'm saying? It has to be seen from that point or we'll never understand the prophecy. 
So verse 3 again. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So John sees this woman riding on a scarlet colored beast with seven heads and ten horns. Does that sound familiar, by the way? It sure does, doesn't it? This beast with seven heads and ten horns. All right. When we go to verse 8, it says, The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. All right. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Then they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Sound very confusing? Okay, all right. This is why I say this is one of the toughest ones to understand. So John is saying, the beast that I saw in vision, right? It had seven heads and ten horns. That beast was, is not, and yet is. That's what John is saying. Okay, let's take a look to see if we can understand what John is talking about. We have John in vision in the wilderness, right? He's been carried there by the angel. So in the wilderness, he sees a beast that was. Are you with me? Okay. In vision, he sees a beast that was. All right. Now, what tense is was? Past tense. Good. All right. Let's keep clear. So in the wilderness, John sees a beast in the vision that was. Okay? And is not. What tense is that? Present, absolutely. Sometimes people get a little confused about that. I don't know what that is, you know. If I say, uh, John is not here tonight, when am I talking? Past, right. present, or future? Right now. Right now, in the present, yeah, okay. So, while well, John, he's, he's in vision, he sees the beast that was and is not. So the beast that is not is in John's present time period in the wilderness. Are you with me? Okay, follow me closely now. Yet is. It refers to the future. He sees the beast that was. He sees the beast that is not in his time period. And then he sees the beast in the future that will rise out of the bottomless pit and go into, uh, go into sin, basically. All right, are you beginning to understand? We, this will help us understand the three periods that John sees. If we remember where he is. So in the wilderness, John sees a beast that was, the beast that is not, and the beast that is going to be. Are you following me? That's what John is saying. Remember to keep John in the right time period. Now, where is John? Where is John? Okay, good, good. I was just checking on you. He's in vision in the wilderness. All right. So the whole prophecy now will clear up. And you'll see exactly what it's talking about. Let's see if we can find out who the beast is. It says in John, uh, in Revelation 17 and verse 11, And the beast was, and the beast that was, and is not, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going into perdition. Now that cleared it right up, didn't it? Wow. Let's see if it just muddled it up a little more, didn't it? All right, because now we've got the eighth one, all right? There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. All right? And when he comes, he must continue a short time. We've seen that text a couple of times. Now, folks, if you've been with me from night to night, we studied all of that, we put all of that together. It should be very clear, but I'm going to review in case there are some, and there are some, that, was, that are just now tuning in. Okay? You remember we studied Daniel 2. There was a metallic image... And it had a head of gold, arms and breast of silver, belly, thigh of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. That image is paralleled now, runs right alongside Daniel 7. And they used, in figurative, they used beasts in symbolism. We found that the head of the gold and the lion equaled Babylon. The arms and breast of silver and the bear represented Medo-Persia. The belly and the thighs of bronze and the leopard with wings represented Greece, and the legs of iron, and the dragon in Daniel 7 both represented pagan Rome. And the fifth kingdom that was 
uh, represented was the feet of iron and clay in Daniel 2 and the nondescript beast with ten horns in Daniel 7. These represented papal Rome. I've showed you that in a couple of episodes back. Now, I took you through those several times. Okay, now I want you to watch as God repeats and enlarges. I told you the way God teaches. He lays out a prophecy, and then he'll repeat it again, and then he'll enlarge it. So watch as God repeats and enlarges. This beast in Revelation 17 has seven heads. Babylon is one of the heads. Are you with me? The second head is Medo-Persia. The third head is the kingdom of Greece. The fourth head is pagan Rome. The fifth head is papal Rome. Now, follow me carefully. Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia fell to Greece. Greece fell to pagan Rome. Pagan Rome fell to papal Rome. Papal Rome fell in 1798 when it received its deadly wound. So five have fallen. Do you see that? Five have fallen. Okay. There we are. One is, now we're talking about John is seeing this. In John's present time, one is, and the other is yet to come in the future. Have you figured out what time period that John is in? He's in the wilderness in vision. At what time period? The time of the sixth beast, right? That's where he is. Let me show you that. At the time of atheism. Atheistic communism. That's why the scripture refers to it as a wilderness. John is in the time period of atheistic communism in Europe, which ruled from 1798 and basically fell in 1991 when the gospel opened again into Europe. Then it says that this seventh beast, which we found out last time, was America. We talked about that just the last video. And when communism fell, this country found itself as a superpower, unrivaled. And now the Bible says that from that point, this power, the United States, would speak as a dragon for a short time. That's the seven heads right there. Now, we look at them very carefully, and now we're going to go a step farther. Speaking of the position of the United States, in an article by the Associated Press in the South Bend Tribune, it said this, Associated Press, March the 8th, 92. In a broad new policy statement that is in its final drafting state, the Defense Department asserts that America's political and military mission in the post-Cold War area will be to ensure that no rival superpower is allowed in Western Europe, Asia, or the territory of the former Soviet Union. So this article makes it very clear the position that the U.S. is taking. She is not going to allow another superpower to come on the scene. She's not going to let a superpower come on the scene if she can help it. All right. In that position, now she speaks as a dragon. We're going back to verse 11 of Revelation 17. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going into perdition. Now, where is John? Let me ask you, where is John? On the Isle of Patmos? He's in vision in the wilderness. Good. All right. You haven't forgotten that. All right. Now, notice the screen. The beast that was can't be atheistic communism because that's in John's present. Are you with me? All right. The beast that was can't be atheistic communism because that's John's present. It can't be the time of the United States because that's John's future. All right? It can't be the time of the United States because that's John's future. So it has to be one of the five that we have studied. When he said that the beast that was and is not, Babylon was and is not, Medo-Persia was and is not, Greece was and is not, pagan Rome was and is not, papal Rome was was and is not. So we've got those five. Are you with me? Those five, it has to be one of those. It has to be one of those five. And notice the screen again, Revelation 17, 11. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seventh and is going into tradition. All right, so John is telling us that the eighth one has to be one of the seven. All right. Don't go running off to some other country trying to put, you know, this beast in another country because that's not what it is. 
John is telling you, it's one of the seven. And we've already seen it can't be the United States or atheistic communism because those two have been eliminated already. John is telling you it's one of the seven. He's made it very, very clear. All right, let's see if we can identify who the eighth one is. We have several points to look at. Number one, several points of identification of who the eighth one is. Number one is one of the seven. So the eighth beast now is one of the seven. The second clue is, this, it is the beast that was. The eighth beast is the beast that was. The third clue is, it is the beast that is not in power at the time of John in the wilderness. Alright, now that's clear. Number four, this beast is also the eighth, which means that particular power has to come back. Can you see that? Because those first five, they was, and they're no more. But now this eighth is one of those five, so that means it has to come back, right? Okay? So one of those five, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, or Papal Rome, has to come back. You ever heard of any of them coming back? Sure you have. We've looked at, looked at it several times. Identity point number five. Had to make war with the saints. Make war with the saints because Scripture says that this woman or the church on the back of the beast made war with the saints. Point number six says that this beast had to have united with the state because she's riding on the back of the beast. This is where she gets her power to make war with the people. Identity point number seven, had to receive a deadly wound. Had to receive a deadly wound. And point number eight, the deadly wound has to be healed. All right, let's look at these eight points and see if any power fits all eight of these points. If you look at those, there's only one that fits the eight points that I've just given you. And it is? Papal Rome. Yeah. Papal Rome. If you can find another one that fits, uh, you know, you, you let me know. But I can't find any other but Papal Rome. These two here were in the future of John's day when he's in the wilderness. These are in the future, and these was and is not. But one has to come back. So we're talking about Papal Rome here. Papal Rome is one of the seven, right? Okay, it's one of the seven. The beast that was, Papal Rome, is one of those five that was and is not. Okay, Napoleon came in and overthrew the papal government February the 15th, 1798, and established a secular one. So during that time, this beast was not or didn't exist. Am I right? Okay, at that time, John is in the wilderness, the, pap the time that John is in the wilderness, the papacy was not. The papacy didn't exist at that time. So number four then, clue number four, is himself also the eighth. So the question, does papal Rome exist today? I said this power has to come back. Does papal Rome exist today? Yeah. <laughs> it certainly does, very definitely. Point number five says it had to make war with the saints. Has papal Rome persecuted the saints? You better believe it. It's been estimated 50 to 100 million that the church put to death during that 1260 years of the Dark Ages. Yeah, she's persecuted. 1260 years of the Dark Ages. I mean, any history book will bring you up on that. Point number six, uniting of church and state. That's what Papal Rome stands for, unity of church and state. That's where she got her authority. And point number seven, would receive a deadly wound. February the 15th, 1798, she received a deadly wound. Some of you wasn't here at that time, and we talked about that Berthier marched into the papacy, right into the Vatican itself, and took the Pope captive, carried him off to France, put him in prison where he died within a year. Received that beast power, received the deadly wound at that time. Point number eight, the deadly wound was healed. The deadly wound was healed in 1929. I showed you that the other day. The deadly wound was healed in 1929 when Mussolini signed the Lateran Pact with the representative of the state. The papal power uh, got to be now a civil government. Thus, the deadly wound was healed. Many things uh, are involved in that Lateran Pact, but the papal power as a civil government now exists after the deadly wound was healed. So Papal Rome is the only one out of the seven that fits all points of identity. What we need to look at at this point is take a clear look, folks, at where are we headed. 
Revelation 17, 9. And before we go to that, did anybody follow me through that? Good, good. You had your thinking hats on. Good, even back there at the back table. All right, I see some of this. That's a good deal. Because that's one of the more complicated ones. We have to keep in mind where John is when he sees these things. All right. Revelation 17, verse 9. The Bible says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. He says, if you want to be smart, listen up. He says, if you want to understand, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. All right? This text mentions seven hills. There is wisdom and looking at that, don't you think? I do. Wikipedia Encyclopedia says, At the time that Revelation was written, the early Christians were persecuted by the Roman Empire, which itself was historically known as the, what is it? City of Seven Hills. All right, continue. It is widely believed that the seven hills mentioned refer to the seven hills of Rome. The footnotes of Revelation 17 in the New American Bible and the Jerusalem Bible, which are both Catholic universal translations, say that the seven hills in this chapter are the seven hills of Rome. Okay. I told you I looked that up, and you, you can actually see an aerial photo of the seven hills in Rome, and they actually have a name for each of the hills. You know, hill number so-and-so. You know, they, they've got names for the hills. All right. That's interesting. Now, let's take a look at the beast that was. Watch carefully now. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. Okay. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. So I can see a dual application here. There are seven mountains on which the woman, the church, sits. There are seven heads on the beast, which are seven kings, and five of the kings have fallen. Verse 11, and the beast that was, and is not, and is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going into perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet. Now we're beginning to bring it down to the time that we live in. Ten kings that have received no kingdom as yet. But they are to receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So we should be able to start putting some things together here. I'm talking about a civil power. I'm talking about what governments will do. Verse 13, these are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to who? Okay, these ten kingdoms we're talking about. They are thinking alike, and they will give their power to the papal power. Now, when it says that these ten kings are of one mind, it's not saying that they're coming together to be just one kingdom. The Bible said there would never be a one ruling empire again. It tells you that they are going to cooperate. They're going to work together. They will be of one mind. Are you following me on that? They're not going to join and become one company or one country. They're going to be of the same mind. Okay. As we studied God's word, we found out that the image of Daniel 2 had ten horns and the ten toes, and they were what? They were ten kings, right? Ten toes, Daniel 2, ten horns in Daniel 7, they were ten kings, all right? And in Daniel 7, the dragon had ten horns. They represented ten kings. Very, very clear. When you get to Daniel, or Revelation, rather, chapter 12, the great red dragon has ten horns, which are ten kings. In Revelation 13, the first beast there has ten horns, which represent ten kings. You see, God is consistent all the way through. When we get to Revelation 17, that beast has ten horns, which equal ten kings. As we study the scriptures, clearly in every one of those prophecies, those ten horns represent the same ten Germanic kingdoms. They're Germanic kingdoms that came down and broke up the Roman Empire. It is talking about the same ones. They were such tribes as the Alemanni, the Franks, the Lombards, the Anglo-Saxons, the Hurrili, the Vandals, the Burgundies, and so on. They are the same ones that make up Western Europe today. The Alemanni became the Germans, the French became the, or the Franks became the French, the Lombards became the Italians, the Anglo-Saxons became the English, and so on. These Germanic tribes became the nations of Western Europe. I hope you're beginning to see some things. These ten kings have received no kingdom as yet, but they are of one mind. 
And now it is called the European Community. How many of you have been over there? You've been over there into Europe and seen some of this European Community? Okay. And the Bible says they will give their power and authority to the beast, the Roman Church. Now, what do we see happening in Europe today? Have these countries, uh, are, are they actually coming together? European Community or the Common Market? What is their thinking? They have one symbol. They use the Tower of Babel to represent their kingdom. And it says, Europe, many tongues, one voice. Now watch closely. Sunday Telegraph from London. The European federal, federalism triumphs. If European federalism triumphs, the EC, the European community, will indeed be an empire. It will lack an emperor. So this says the European community will be an empire. Indeed, it is coming to that. And we now have the Ural. The Ural, uh, I've told you the other night, I've been there a number of times. And you can spend the Ural in just about any country over there. You used to, when you were in England, you had to have the English currency. Whenever you went to, you know, France, you had to have French currency. You can travel from any place over there now and spend the Ural. You used to have to stop at the borders and show your passport, you know. Had to have papers to go from Germany, you know, to go over to some other country. Now you don't. You just drive on. Nobody stops you. Nobody questions it. Because now they have a European community. Community. Just a few years ago, Europe united their armies. They have the largest army in the world. You can imagine all of these countries joining forces. They have the largest forces in the world. Now listen to what the Sunday Telegraph in London said back in 1991. If European federalism triumphs, the European community will indeed be an empire. It will lack an emperor, but it will have the, it will have the Pope. It is difficult not to think that Wajitola realizes this, that's the Pope. They say it will be an empire, but it lacks an emperor. But we'll have the Pope. That's who Europe is looking to. This is what has been taking place in the last number of years. This is happening today. It's moving forward. And you can get CNN news just as well as I can to start seeing some things falling into place. The time that we are living in. There is a man by the name of Charles Malik. He was president of the Assembly of the United Nations. He also served as an ambassador from Lebanon to the United States. He's a, he has been a great lecturer at Harvard. This man is in the thick of things. Listen to what he said. The only hope for the Western world lies in an alliance between the Roman Catholic Church, which is the most commonly influential, controlling, unifying element in Europe. He said Rome must <coughs> unite. Now watch. And the Eastern Orthodox Church. Rome must unite with the Eastern Orthodoxy because the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Church controls the Western Middle East. That's it. That is the east end of the Mediterranean. And if they don't solidify that control, if these churches don't join together, he says, Islam will march across Europe. Islam is political. The only hope of the Western world lies then in a united Europe under the control of the Pope. If they don't join together, he says, these two main groups of Europe, Islam will march across Europe. So he's saying it is absolutely imperative that these two unite. Are there movements towards that? Listen as we go on. And then all Protestant Christians, this is the same quote, then all Protestant Christians around the globe must come into submission to the Pope so we will have a united Christian world. All Protestant Christians must come into submission to the Pope. Folks, we are called Protestants for a reason, aren't we? Yes. Protestants means I protest against the teachings of the church. When Martin Luther came out with the thesis, the 95 Thesis, and, and pinned it to the wall of the Wittenberg Church, he was coming away from the papacy. You know, he had been a priest himself. He was a priest. And he wrote out the things that were in, in error, the things that were against the Word of God, and he posted them on the church doors in Wittenberg. And that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. 
The Protestant Reformation means that I protest what the church is teaching. And here we find, that, and then all Protestant Christians around the globe must come into submission of the Pope so that we will have a united Christian world. Protestants protest to what the church teaches. And I told you a couple of nights ago, the teaching that the papacy is the beast of Revelation 13 and so many of these others, the beast of Revelation 17, that was so prevalent in the early days of Martin Luther and the reformers that all mainline churches taught that the papacy was this beast. I'm talking about all of them, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Church of Godders, whoever, in the beginning of their formation, they all said that the papacy was the beast of Revelation 13. This is not just something new, you know, that, that I believe. All right. God's word says that these ten kings have received no kingdom as yet, but they are of one mind. They've got to start thinking alike first, you see. They will, when they come to the conclusion, something has to be done, you know, that we have to uh, fight, however, against Islam. They put their minds together and they give their authority to the beast. All right, let's take it a step farther. Last night, last time, we identified the two-horned beast uh, as the United States. There's not another power in the face of the earth that fits the two-horned beast except the United States. Listen to what the United States will do. Revelation 13, verse 12 says, And he exercises all of the authority of the first beast. So we're talking about the second beast, this beast right over here, which represents the United States. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast, the papacy, in his presence. And he causes the earth and all of those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. It can't be any mistake about who this is. We talk about receive a deadly wound and the wound was healed. We can't be mistaken. The first beast of Revelation 13 with the seven heads and the ten horns we identified as papal power. And as I say, if you're here for the first time, you know, it may not make a whole lot of sense to you. But when you get caught up on it, you'll see that it is. So then this also predicts the U.S. is going to give its power and its authority to the first beast. That's a lot of uh, power and authority, believe me. The United States, the superpower of the world, giving its power and authority, putting it behind the papal power. That's what it says will happen. And friends, watch carefully the moves that are taking place to unite the church and the state in this country. Let me tell you a basic fact. Many of the things that are said today from those who are interested in bringing the church and the state together, many of those things are good things, and I couldn't disagree with them at all. But don't misunderstand me. Many of the things that are proposed need to be done. But there is a basic fact, and the basic fact simply is this. Once the pendulum begins to swing, it does not stop. It swings all the way. You know how the pendulum goes? Once it begins to swing, it cannot be stopped. Unfortunately, when you take a church and you, it begins to take over civil authority, it's going to swing right on up. You know, maybe you've heard the old saying, let the camel get his nose in your tent and he'll sleep with you tonight. Mm-hmm. That's very, very true in this case. When the church gets its nose into the civil government, you better believe that we're headed for some serious times. Time Magazine, 1992. And these are all actually outdated. I'm sure you can find much, much more at CNN. This was the Time Magazine, February 24, 1992. This was one of the greatest secret alliances of all time. Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the disillusion of the communist empire. I didn't know that, did you? They talked about it was a secret. Let me back it up. This was one of the great secret alliances of all time. After it happened, of course, it can come out in Time Magazine, you see. I didn't know that was going on, did you? We don't know what our politicians, what our country leaders are doing behind our back. We have no idea. This is one of the great secret alliances of all time. Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the communist empire. Step by reluctant step, the Soviets and the communist government of Poland bowed to the moral, economic, and political pressure 
imposed by the Pope and the President. Time magazine said one of the great secret allies of all time, Reagan and the Pope. We find the church and the state has been working together for some time. We don't know what our politicians are doing. Let me tell you, we'll find out after the fact, just like we did there. We're moving down a road that history tells us will not work. It won't work. One other statement, Time Magazine. One of the earliest goals as president, Reagan says, was to recognize the Vatican as a state and make them, a, make them an ally. Thus, the two-horned beast will cause the world to worship the first beast. That's what the Bible says. So what I'm telling you, things are going on in Europe. They have been for many years. How many of our presidents have kissed the ring of the Pope, by the way? Huh? It clearly says in God's Word that those powers are going to work together and they're going to give authority to the beast. Presidents are seeking the counsel of the Pope. How many of our presidents have gone to Vatican City to meet with the Pope? Like they need counsel from the Pope, you see. Trying to work with the Pope, that's what they're doing. 2 Peter 1.9 says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. It means prophecy has been confirmed. We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well, to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. He says, if you're smart, listen to prophecy. We have it confirmed now until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. We need to heed the counsel of God's Word. Amen? Amen. All right. Do you know where we go from chapter 17? After chapter 17 of the book of Revelation, it talks about this woman in 18 and 19. And after that, we're in heaven. Right. We're nearly the end of the book, you know? Yeah. We are at the end. God help us is all I can say. Amen? Amen. Again, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, again, we just thank you for the message through your Holy Spirit that you bring to your people. And I pray that our hearts and minds once again have been open to the understanding of the word that you have sent so clearly if we would but study the word. Again, thank you for each and every one that has assembled this evening. And again, we just lift you up, Lord Jesus, what a mighty God you are. And in your name we pray. Amen.